Hello everyone, um, so it's quarter past 11, we'll start again from the break. Um, before we do, just say a quick thank you to the DWP for a great start to the day. And then moving on to this session, um, we have our keynote presentation from Daniel Edmiston from the London School of Economics and the Autonomous University of Barcelona. So Daniel is a British Academy Wolfson Fellow and his current research draws on the Family Resources Survey, Understanding Society and Qualitative Longitudinal Ethnographic Research to explore the determinants, dynamics and policy implications of deep poverty. And he's also Principal Investigator of the Who Counts Project and um, this is affiliated with the Autonomous University of Barcelona and it's re-examining poverty by addressing non-coverage error in distributional analysis across Europe. And today Daniel will be presenting on understanding the prevalence and effects of deep poverty through existing data infrastructure. And Daniel will speak for about 30 minutes and then there will be time for questions. Please put all your questions in the chat at any point and then we'll pick them up during the Q&A session. So at this point I'll pass over to Daniel if he's ready there. Yeah, I'm here. Could you hear me okay? We can hear you great, yeah. Great. Um, yeah, uh, thanks so much for the introduction, Jennifer. Um, yeah, as, as Jennifer was saying, uh, I'm currently a researcher at the London School of Economics and the Autonomous University of uh, Barcelona, and I'm going to be talking uh, a little bit today about two projects, one that is slightly further along than the other. So one funded by the British Academy and Wilson Foundation and another by the European Research Council. And what I want to do over the next 30 minutes or so is reflect upon the extent to which existing data infrastructure um, and data practices currently kind of frame or potentially delimit our understanding um, of the prevalence and effects of deep poverty um, in the UK. Um, so why deep poverty uh, rather than kind of low income living standards more generally? Well, through the course of this presentation, I want to try and illustrate why deep poverty specifically um, presents a series of challenges uh, to both low income uh, households, but also to researchers and policymakers um, to help inform the kind of most effective targeting of finite resources to, um, to low income households going forward, looking into the future. But to do so, um, I think it's really important to set some context and do so by looking back um, at kind of what we've been doing over the last uh, 40, 45 years or so. Um, so if, if we do look back at uh, kind of trends in public social expenditure, so that's expenditure on cash benefits, direct in kind provision of goods and services, tax breaks with some kind of social purpose, we can see that as a percentage of GDP, we've invested really quite considerably in public social expenditure and social policy uh, interventions across the OECD and the G7. Um, and in the UK as well. So since 1980, uh, public social expenditure as a percentage of GDP has increased by more than a third. Um, despite this considerable investment uh, of public funds, um, we haven't seen a kind of corresponding reduction um, in overall levels of poverty and challenges around deep poverty specifically seem to be uh, pretty stubborn in terms of uh, moving. If we look at the OECD and the G7 that's highlighted on this slide in front of you, we can see that the, the kind of mean poverty gap after taxes and transfers has increased despite this growth in public social expenditure. And in the UK context, the poverty gap has increased uh, by more than a quarter. And one of the reasons for this is the partly to do with the kind of coverage, but also the targeting of low income social security. So 
the UK net replacement rate in unemployment benefit from uh, the year 2000 to 2023 has uh, fallen by uh, almost a fifth. So we're spending uh, a great deal of money uh, as, as a country to either stay in the same place when it comes to certain poverty uh, measures or in certain cases for things to be uh, getting worse. And this suggests that we're not targeting resources where they're perhaps most urgently needed if we want to improve living standards for those um, with the least. And I think there's been um, a kind of growing recognition of this as, as in, in the previous presentations with from organisations like Social Metrics Commission and a kind of renewed effort to focus on those in the deepest forms of poverty. And what I want to do uh, in this presentation is reflect on um, kind of the extent to which existing data infrastructure is kind of constraining uh, or kind of boundary, kind of delimiting those, those efforts to kind of focus on those in deep poverty. And I want to do that by um, reflecting a little bit on um, the Family Resources Survey um, and uh, under Understanding Society uh, panel data, two data sets um, uh, hosted through UK Data Service that have kind of proven so kind of crucial to our understanding of living standards and, uh, and what's been going on over time. And I want to uh, kind of pose these three questions in the presentation. So what do we already know about the kind of prevalence, profile and effects of deep poverty? What forms and degrees of poverty are currently missed through existing data infrastructure and analysis? And then perhaps too ambitiously for 30 minutes, what um, can uh, be done about it? So for the first question, what do we already know? Um, so despite um, kind of a, a flatlining in the relative poverty rate uh, in recent years, We've seen considerable changes to the overall profile uh, of people that are in poverty, such that uh, the poverty gap, has, as I was uh, just showing, has in increased quite considerably for those below 60% of median incomes. But if we look further uh, down the income distribution for those that fall furthest from the poverty line, so for example here highlighted in yellow, those falling more than 50% below the poverty line, we can see that the poverty gap for this group has um, increased the most. And I think this kind of um, highlights some of the problems with aggregation and headcount measures that many of us are, uh, are familiar with. So there's considerable diversity in kind of changes in living standards for those that fall below the poverty line. There's also diversity in who is being affected by these trends. And in a piece of work that uh, I did with uh, Runnymede um, a couple of years ago in, uh, at, the, at the start of the cost of living crisis, um, we explored um, how black Asian minority ethnic households were faring relative uh, to white households um, in the run-up to that big spike in inflation that we saw. Um, and there's a growing gap between um, Black Asian minority ethnic households and white households um, in recent years. And this is for a range of reasons um, to do with kind of labour market change, household composition, but it's also um, affected by changes to our uh, particularly working age social security system, whereby uh, black Asian minority ethnic households, um, particularly black Asian minority ethnic women, have um, kind of lost the most from welfare reforms that have been introduced uh, over, uh, over the last uh, 10, 15 years or so. And this kind of, uh, this kind of diversity within the low income income distribution, we can see also reflected in uh, a kind of splintering or bifurcation um, in living uh, standard gains, whereby 
those towards uh, the very uh, bottom of the income distribution, furthest away uh, from the poverty line, um, have uh, lost, um, if we kind of compare how they've done since the global financial crisis in 2007, 2008, and those closer towards the poverty line seeing uh, modest um, gains. But with this kind of increasing intensity uh, of poverty over time, there's been growing but sometimes fragmented interest in the problem of so-called deep poverty uh, in recent years, with a range of measures emerging to explore low income dynamics and living standards, uh, of people falling to varying degrees below the poverty line. There's a lot of information, far too much, I'm sorry, um, on, uh, on these couple of slides, but I've just put them there to try and illustrate that, as um, somebody said in, a, uh, in the previous uh, talk, there's actually a relatively little consensus on how the depth of poverty should be defined or, or measured um, in the UK such that a range of indicators and terms are currently in circulation uh, that sometimes kind of reproduce some of the problems associated with that kind of aggregated threshold headline indicator of low, uh, of low incomes. But if we take just uh, three of the definitions that have been um, uh, in circulation over, over the last few years, so 50% of median incomes, 40% of median incomes, and 50% below the poverty line, we can see that those on the lowest incomes make up an increasing share of the low income population, such that in the mid 1990s, around one in five uh, people living in poverty fell more than 50% below the poverty line. Um, but by 2020, 2021, this had risen uh, to uh, 28%. And drawing uh, obviously, uh, on uh, the Family Resources Survey here, and in certain cases, I've, I've kind of stopped the trend at a point where, as people highlighted previously, there's been some concerns around uh, differences in, in kind of response rates and data collection methods. So that's kind of what we know about the changing prevalence of deep poverty. Now, what I want to do is uh, think through a little bit around the the effects of deep poverty. So there's been fantastic work exploiting uh, the Family Resources Survey and Understanding Society by organisations like the Joseph Browntree Foundation to try and kind of better understand the risk factors that are associated with deep poverty, uh, some of uh, the, the effects of it. Um, and in a really helpful report that was published by the Joseph Browntree Foundation um, recently, uh, they found that around half of people that are living in very deep poverty move out of uh, very deep poverty each year. So there's a relative amount of uh, uh, flux in terms of people's kind of movement across or up or down the income distribution. And in um, this report published by JRF, um, they said, that, this is a quote, the higher ex exit rates from very deep poverty likely help uh, to explain why short-term periods um, of very deep poverty are much more common than persistent very deep poverty. And one thing that I do want to kind of add to uh, that really important body of work is, is, is a kind of question of, well, um, relative to what? So very often we kind of compare the outcomes or trends of people living in um, deep poverty or very deep poverty to the wider income distribution. But what I think is really important to do to clarify kind of where research and policy priorities kind of should be focused is to think through how deeper forms of poverty compare to shallower forms of poverty. So how do those faring furthest away from the poverty line fare to those uh, closer to it? So here I've um, drawn on uh, understanding society panel data to look at rates of persistent poverty. Um, so that's those falling below 60% of median incomes in a given wave, and then for at least two of the following three waves. So this only goes up to, um, this goes from uh, 
2009 to uh, 2020. And we can see that um, rates of persistent poverty are consistently um, higher amongst those that are in deeper forms of poverty. So there's something about the experience of living on an extremely low income that makes uh, it less likely that you will escape uh, poverty uh, overall, such that in 2009-2012 period, 37% uh, of those in shallow, shallow poverty um, uh, were in persistent poverty compared to 44% of those in deeper forms of poverty. And that difference between um, these, these kind of two um, poverty categories or experiences um, has grown um, uh, such that in 2017-2020 um, the kind of rate of persistent poverty um, remained the same uh, for those in shallow forms of poverty but has increased um, uh, quite considerably over this over this period to 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 fifty two percent. So there's something about the the kind of stickiness of deep poverty that I think warrants further attention um, uh, in kind of using data sets like Family Resources Survey uh, and Understanding Society. There are also uh, a range of kind of downstream effects associated with deep poverty. Um, that I think are worth highlighting when we compare those in shallower and deeper forms of poverty. Um, this is kind of death by chart, so I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about this. So I'm, I'm, I'm not going to run through all of these, but I've looked at kind of the, the mental health uh, profile of um, those that are above the poverty line, those that are just below it or are below it, and those that are considerably below it. And uh, we're currently undertaking survival analysis and multi-level multi models to look at how the kind of the effects of uh, being on a low income differ between these uh, these three groups. Um, so we're looking at this uh, across a range of domains to do with uh, public health, uh, sorry, um, uh, physical health, uh, mental health, subjective well-being. Um, and uh, life satisfaction. Um, I'm not going to uh, go through all of these, but one of the things that um, uh, I did want to highlight uh, is, sorry, I'm jumping around all over these slides, but one of the things that I uh, was uh, hoping to highlight was that as a social kind, the experience or the kind of effects associated um, with shallow poverty are closer sometimes to those uh, for people that are above the poverty line, which is a considerable proportion of, uh, of the population. Such that there's, again, distinctive effects and outcomes that are associated with deep poverty that uh, bring uh, shallow poverty closer in line with those above the poverty line that um, offers lessons for how uh, we might think about the design of income targeting and the potential added value of trying to create a kind of minimum income scheme or, or, or baseline uh, whereby the social security system protects people um, uh, from both falling into deep poverty, assists um, them in trying to be able to escape it and then mitigate some of the social outcomes uh, that are associated with it. So, I think from existing data infrastructure, this is uh, kind of what we know. But I now want to turn to think through a little bit more about what we don't know um, when it comes to the forms and degrees of poverty that are currently uh, missed through existing data infrastructure uh, and analysis. And I want to start this by thinking through um, uh, the kind of the standardized approach to household income surveys or population income surveys. So official poverty statistics, not just in the UK, but in many, many other parts of the world, um, typically identify private households as their target population. And as a result, those not living in private households are currently excluded uh, from distributional analysis um, that's undertaken to examine poverty and some of the social policies that are conceived 
to tackle it. So um, on the right hand side of your screen, um, these are all kind of uh, locations or, or, or sites where many of the non-private household population live. And if you look at the list, you can see that these areas are a, a considerable site of uh, kind of social policy spending and um, social policy uh, intervention. But the living standards uh, of these populations, as uh, many people already know on this call, are, um, are, are not currently captured by official poverty statistics. And I would argue that this significantly kind of undermines examination of uh, both poverty incidents uh, but also the depth of poverty and some of the kind of risk factors or determinants that are linked to it. And this is for a number of reasons. First, because the size of the non-private household population is small, but it's not um, trivial. Um, in many parts of Europe, it has um, actually grown um, quite considerably over the last 10 to 15 years. Those that are part of this non-private household population are not only likely, uh, more likely to experience poverty, but more extreme forms of poverty and destitution. And those that are part of um, different population subgroups um, within the non-private household population exhibit distinctive characteristics in terms of age, employment, uh, education, their demographic profile, their migration status. Um, and this is kind of a, a, a small but missing part of the puzzle when it helps us, uh, when it comes to trying to understand uh, low income living standards and particularly low income living standards um, at the very bottom of the income distribution. Um, to illustrate this, Again, I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm not sponsored by the, the Joseph Browntree Foundation, but I'm going to be uh, drawing on some really excellent work that they've funded um, uh, that was undertaken by colleagues at Harriet Watt University, uh, looking at the kind of changing prevalence of destitution um, in the UK. And as part of the kind of latest report that was published in this, in, in this program of work, they found that around a quarter of the estimated 3.8 million people experiencing destitution in the UK are part of this non-private household population, but quite a considerable proportion. So this is people living in temporary accommodation, hostels, refuges, b and shelters, um, people that might be sleeping rough or staying with friends and family on a, uh, on a very kind of temporary basis. So around 950,000, almost a million people um, are uh, missing uh, from the, the poverty numbers that we have. So drawing on uh, the Family Resources Survey to try and incorporate the non-private household uh, population overall um, and those that are experiencing uh, more extreme forms uh, of poverty, destitution, um, we can see that uh, this uh, as we might expect, has an upward effect um, on the overall rates of relative poverty, so 60% of median incomes, but also um, it has an upward effect on those falling um, more than 50% uh, below the, the poverty line. In terms of the overall profile of poverty and the, the composition of those living on the very lowest incomes, we can see that it also has an upward effect on those falling uh, more than 50% below the poverty line and um, uh, a non-trivial um, increase as well. So from that, we know that some people are missing from surveys to some extent by uh, design uh, for very kind of uh, good instrumental reasons. But this, uh, as we know, risks are kind of understanding of poverty uh, biases are kind of understanding of um, uh, poverty prevalence for the de facto population of the UK. What we also know is that some people are missing from surveys, um, potentially because of non-response bias. So here, just looking at the response rate for the Family Resources Survey, we can see that the response rate um, to, to this has um, gradually fallen 
um, since the year 2000, from 65% to 49% just before the pandemic. And since the pandemic, um, it's fallen quite considerably because of the challenges surrounding kind of data collection and, uh, and logistics. And there's some um, incredibly helpful publications, um, especially those that have uh, been published most recently, uh, trying to kind of think through what, um, kind of who is potentially missing by uh, looking at correspondence between what's reported in FRS um, and um, comparing that to administrative records. From that, we know that those living in accommodation with the lowest council tax bands are now slightly underrepresented in, F in FRS. Um, and there's also evidence that particular benefit recipients um, are um, underrepresented or missing uh, from uh, FRS. And I think these, these trends give reasonable cause for concern about um, the, 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 the kind of health of, uh, of FRS and its, its capacity to construct um, poverty estimates that reflect poverty prevalence in the de facto population. Um, and I want to kind of ex explore this a little bit more by um, actually drawing on um, some qualitative longitudinal fieldwork that I've been undertaking over the last um, couple of years. So I, I, I've been doing qualitative longitudinal fieldwork with 40 individuals that are in so-called deep poverty and was really keen to kind of capture a range of experiences from those that are often missing or underrepresented in poverty research. Um, I've undertaken 76 interviews so far. Um, by wave two, um, I had a retention rate of 90%. And one of the reasons behind um, this retention rate of 90% was because I tried to tailor a, a kind of recruitment and retention strategy to the kind of challenges faced by those struggling on a really, really low income. So collecting kind of multiple backup contact details um, from individuals taking part, but also friends, families, social networks. And without um, doing so, the retention rate for this very small qualitative piece of work would have been much lower, around 63% by wave two. And this is because um, deepening forms of poverty through the course of fieldwork, it transpired often, as you would expect, triggered considerable, considerable upheaval in people's lives. Um, so a third had lost, sold, pawned or changed their telephone, and a third had moved to different or uh, they'd sadly lost uh, accommodation and a fixed address during fieldwork. And crucially, those falling into deeper forms of poverty were much more likely to move and change their contact details. So 70% of those Again, a very small sample, but 70% of those with worse incomes had done so compared to only 28% of those whose incomes had remained the same or improved. And from this uh, kind of th this very small piece of uh, qualitative field work, I want to reflect on how the kind of these things might play out in um, uh, very large scale surveys like family resources survey or well, in this case understanding society. So here um, I've kind of looked at understanding society data and the attrition rates by income status again uh, drawing that distinction between and comparing the outcomes for those in deep poverty, uh, shallow poverty and no poverty and we can see that um, in terms of being a social kind, when there's been really considerable kind of onboarding of people through the course of the, uh, understanding society data, we can see that those in shallower forms of poverty in terms of their attrition rates um, are much lower and closer to those above the poverty line compared to um, those that are in the deepest uh, forms uh, of poverty. So we're keeping- Last two minutes. Okay, thanks very much. So we, we're kind of holding close to um, the, the certain uh, population subgroups and people that um, uh, are, le are less likely to experience deep forms of poverty. And I think this presents 
a very serious challenge for kind of what we can use existing data infrastructure for um, and um, the kind of inferences that can be drawn from it. Um, as per usual, I'm terrible in my timing, so I'm going to um, skip forward to uh, the last couple of slides. So what can be done about it? So um, over the next uh, five years, I'm going to be working with a, a research team uh, on a project to try and kind of get a handle on some of these issues through a project called Who Counts? Um, so we're going to be kind of drawing on information about the non-private household population and those that are less likely to respond to things like family resources survey and understanding society, but in a European context to better understand some of the kind of changing profile drivers and depth of poverty. And through the course of the project, I'm hoping that we can uh, improve the accuracy of uh, poverty um, poverty estimates for the de facto population, um, uh, particularly along key socio-demographic lines, improving understanding of anti-poverty policy, what's working, where and why, and trying to nuance explanations of poverty risk dynamics and some of the groups that are uh, worst affected. Again, I don't have time to go into the imp implementation, but suffice to say that we're going to be looking at a range of co uh, countries that really differ in terms of the size of the non-private household population and differ in terms of the kind of demo demographic characteristics of, of that non-private household population group. So last slide, I, I promise, Jennifer. Um, so just to conclude, the I think the prevalence and intensity of poverty for the de facto population is is very likely underestimated as a result of current uh, data infrastructure and practices, and that's not to downplay the considerable considerable value that they add. Um, but I think a non-trivial population um, are currently missing uh, or underrepresented that is likely to kind of distort our understanding of deep poverty risks and determinants. And this seems um, somewhat perverse, particularly given that a considerable part of that uh, social policy expenditure that I was talking about at the beginning that we've seen such a growth in um, goes towards these groups. And we don't fully understand how they feature in low income living standards and trends. Those missing, as I said, are very diverse in their characteristics across countries. And I think trying to attend to this diversity um, in kind of tackling uh, non-coverage error or non-response bias can help us improve the accuracy of poverty estimates. And th this really can and, uh, and should inform kind of a more effective targeting of social policy interventions and transfers, given some of the very kind of distinctive um, risk factors that are associated with deep poverty compared to shallower forms of it. I'm sorry for uh, running, running over, Jennifer, I've timed, timed that terribly. <laughs> No, no, no need to apologise. It's um, that's great. Thank you very much. So it's a great overview of research on deep poverty. 